Okay, now that we know what life is, how did it get started on Earth? We're sort of looking through, um, uh, well, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be looking at how life got started and follow the history of life. And so we know what um, branch we're looking at or what, how we're, um, how the animals that we're going to be looking at through this uh, period, through this course, uh, fit into the big picture. And what I'd advise you to do is go to this uh, URL and check out this YouTube video, which is a brilliant um, history of how life got started on Earth. And it explains a little bit about the different types of cells uh, and how things branched. Okay. So just in a, in a nutshell, though, three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago, the Earth was uh, formed about four and a half billion years ago. So three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago, when the, as soon as the Earth cooled enough um, from the titanic collisions that heated it up, uh, uh, as soon as it cooled enough for life to appear, it did. And so these very simple single-cell prokaryotic um, organisms appeared in the fossil record. And by fossil record, we're only, we really only are able to look at the residuals and the way that they changed rocks, but there are, um, uh, they didn't leave a lot of evidence of themselves except for these things called uh, um, stromatolites, which you've probably seen in the video. Um, simple, small stuff was, was uh, still the most successful and was the most successful. It's been around for three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago. We've barely been here for uh, a moment of time in terms of geological time. And if you look at the uh, average um, teaspoon of seawater, uh, you may have viruses between in the numbers between 10 and 100 million in that amount of seawater. And uh, maybe you'll have uh, five to 20 million bacteria in that teaspoon of seawater. So, in fact, it's amazing that we can see through all of the, the stuff that is in the, the seawater, if you could examine all of that um, microbial stuff. And um, the uh, amazing thing is that we have only, just in the last 20 to 30 years, started to realize the importance of the, the microbial um, life in the ocean, the very small stuff in terms of how uh, everything works. And that is a, a very a, very much a growing field. So first, first this for 700,000 years, we had um, these uh, single-celled organisms. And then this, they started aggregating together. And um, then multicellular life forms about 570 million years ago. And these were um, where uh, we started to see some larger uh, jelly-like, worm-like organisms. Um, and you know that the, this, uh, you can date different deposits around the uh, world by looking and finding the similar um, fossil life through that time. So this is the Precambrian era, era and then uh, you might see organisms like this if you reconstructed them. Jelly-like, uh, very um, soft-bodied uh, things, mostly probably filter feeding and absorbing organisms. Okay, and then um, in the Cambrian explosion, we had more complex. They developed shells, primitive life forms, um, we st and there was a lot of ad adaptation. And we still have the uh, ancient life forms, cyanobacteria, um, archaeobacteria, that all the very ancient uh, types of life in ocean vents, hot springs, and other anaerobic environments. But in fact, those things are being found in open water and uh, uh, to be more prevalent than we than we than we expected. Okay, so. Um, Multicellular life is becoming more complex at the Cambrian explosion. All right. So only ten, less than ten percent of earthly time, though, has, has multicellular life been around. Okay. And so the multicellular life has branched 
into these kingdoms. Now there's actually a newer model that has six or eight kingdoms of organisms, but um, we're going to stick with this one because this is the uh, most commonly seen one. Okay, and unless you're getting into microbiology, you probably don't necessarily even care too much about the other kingdoms. Okay, so Monera, singular, uh, single cells, very, very small stuff, back, um, bacteria and the like, uh, prokaryotic, which means they don't have any uh, organelles inside the small organs, with organ-like things within their cells. Okay, this is all the, uh, uh, the bacteria, the very small stuff. Protists, okay. Single-celled, but they are eukaryotic. They've uh, got uh, organelles within their within their cell walls. Okay, um, and then we get into the bigger stuff. We're looking at we've got plants, animals, and fungi. Okay, so what's the difference between these these three? Well, you'll learn all about plants in coastal botany, so we're not going to go into that right now. Fungi and animals, okay? Neither of these, these are both eukaryotic, multicellular. Neither of them um, make their own food like plants do through photosynthesis. Okay, and they reproduce, sex, reproduce sexually. All right, but the question now is what makes up an animal? Okay, and unfortunately I've just flashed that on, but if you stop right here and think about what makes an animal, go ahead and brainstorm and then come back in a couple of minutes. Okay, stop the video, brainstorm for a couple of minutes. Okay, you're back. Um, you might have come up with uh, movement. You might have come up with uh, teeth or hair or fur or, uh, or bones or um, who knows what you might have come up with. Uh, but an animal is simply something that has multiple cells and heterotrophic. That means it um, it eats its it eats food. It doesn't eat um, a lot of times. People think of uh, organisms uh, requiring nutrients, but nutrients are um, the broken down products of eating food. So you eat food and then uh, turn those that food into nutrients. But um, they are animals. They're, the animals are multicellular. They're, they've got a lot of, they've got multiple cells, lots of cells. Uh, so they tend to be bigger and they're heterotrophic, which means they eat other organisms. Okay. And they, they actually ingest those rather than absorb those. Okay. So uh, animals don't sit in the environment and absorb nutrients. They have to feed on other new organisms in order to uh, to carry on their life. Okay, so evolution. What is evolution and how does it work? How did we get from those tiny little uh, single microbial life, single cells, up to the big things that we are now? You're watching a video on a computer right now, and uh, if you think about that, that is a marvel um, from going from single-celled organisms to uh, ourselves with the big brains. And um, the ability to move and change our environment around uh, as like we do, it's uh, really quite incredible. And uh, obviously, it's too incredible for some people to believe in, but um, if you're going to be a good biologist, then you have to be able to understand evolution. It's the most important concept in biology. You cannot understand biology without understanding evolution. It informs why and how every part of every organism on the planet is the way it is. It informs how we move, how we walk, how we think, how we uh, respond to stimulus, what shape our bodies are, and the same with every other organism on the planet. It's so important, and, uh, so, and nothing in biology makes sense without knowing about evolution. 
Okay, and if that challenges you, um, for your views, uh, hopefully then we can have a little discussion about that uh, when we get to class. But for you don't need to necessarily believe in the evolutionary process. Um, but I hope that once you see the evidence that you can't help but believe in it and um, that it is the most likely of any way that it is the most likely uh, process by which um, we have arrived at the state of the uh, ecology that we are in. And um, even if you choose not to believe in evolution, then um, in the evolutionary process, I should say, then you still have to understand it in order to do well in this class. Okay. So, in fact, that's a good rule of thumb at, at all times. Don't uh, discount something that you don't understand. <laughs> okay. So, reproduction. All organisms. So, how does evolution work? Okay, and this is where you brainstormed before in the first video. All right, uh, but if it's very simple. If you can understand these five um, sentences, and uh, I've got I've provided quite a bit of other material, and we'll be going over this in class. But if you can understand these five sentences, six sentences, then you will be able to understand how evolution works. Okay, so reproduction. All organisms carry on reproducing reproduction. And their, or, their offspring tend to look like themselves. Puppies look like uh, the adults, the adult dogs, okay? Little elephant babies look like little elephants, okay? Um, little bacteria or offspring of bacteria look like the parent bacteria. And um, uh, it's the same for every organism on the planet. Little baby um, minor birds look like baby minor birds. They don't look like eagles. Okay, but one of the... Um, so there you go, reproduction. All organisms reproduce similar to, to descendant organisms. But they also tend to produce more organisms, more offspring, than can s actually survive. Okay, so some of the offspring are going to die. The reproductive potential of the parent population always greatly exceeds the actual number of descendants. So if you think about it, um, if you think about how many eggs something like a, uh, a good-sized snapper can lay, which is maybe, say, 500,000 at a, a spawning, all right? So that snapper, could, if all of those eggs were fertilized and grew to adults, would produce 500,000 um offspring. And if all of those offspring were to survive and all of the snapper that were out there were to produce 500,000 snapper, there wouldn't be any room for the water in the Hauraki Gulf before too long if they, if they all were able to survive. Of course, they don't all survive. And um, the, so most of the offspring that are going to be produced are going to just die. They're probably not going to make it to maturity. Okay, and of those 500,000 offspring, there are going to be some differences. Some of the some of the larval fish, some of the small fish will grow faster than the others. Some will be shorter than others at the same uh, weight. Some will be uh, heavier than others at the same length. Some of them might be darker in color. Some of them might be lighter in color. Just like you and your brothers and sisters don't look exactly the same, just like everybody in the class looks quite different, there's a lot of variation in the members of a population. Okay, so variation. Members of a population always vary. All right. So, which leads to, um, because there is there are more offspring produced than can survive, and because um, there's going to, because of that limitation in the ability of the environment to provide for all of those offspring, to provide food and, and space for all of those offspring, then those offspring are going to have to compete with each other for the resources available. 
and they're going to have to compete. Uh, there's competition um, by well, there is. They're going to have to be able to adapt to um, not only finding those resources and uh, and finding space to live in, but also to be able to avoid predators, avoid being eaten, and uh, so the competition between those those individuals um, means that those with that are the most favorable have the most favorable characteristics will have the most likely chance of living to adulthood. So let's say snapper. Now, if we have uh, snapper that are um, very, very light in color and they settle in an area that's uh, got a dark sediment and they hang around the bottom, maybe they'll be more visible to um, to... Uh, a predator. Now let's say that there's a, or maybe there's a very light sediment. Maybe you have a population where you have mostly light colored snapper um, that live over a sandy bottom. Okay, so they're light colored, they blend in with the bottom. Let's say that there's a, uh, a massive flood and you get a whole lot of sediment um, build up on the bottom, and that sediment is darker colored. It's silt. There's a siltation event. Now, all those snapper that are light colored are going to stand out a lot more than their um, their darker brothers and sisters. And um, so, perhaps you'll see a change in the population where there's a selective pressure for darker snapper to. Um, to survive, okay, and so you maybe you'll get a change in the population be, from darker or from lighter snapper to darker snapper. So anyway, you can look at all of the different characteristics that are that um, uh, that vary between all individuals within a population, and they will all have some selective. Um, benefit or cost to that individual, okay? So cheetahs that can run faster and faster and faster, maybe they have uh, lighter and lighter bones, but eventually those bones will be so light that they'll tend to break in, um, in accidents or in, uh, uh, in, at high stress environments or high stress times. And so there's a, there's a cost and a benefit to lighter bones. Okay, so event, the ones, the most favorable um, shape will be the one that uh, survives the best. And then those ones that survive the best will have the most chance to reproduce and they'll leave more descendants in the environment that look like them. Okay, so that is evolution in a nutshell. And uh, we will be spending a bit of time on that in class and um, with the resources that I've provided for you. And uh, so you will need to be able to explain that to me uh, or show me that you know how that evolution works. Okay? So let's have a little further look into it. Okay, the environment varies both in time and space. Okay, it leads to heritable, heritable variations that are suited to these particular environments being selected, result in divergence and differentiation of populations. So you can have two popula or a population that's spread out quite widely uh, geographically, and you can have then um, divergence and differentiation of those populations in two different parts of the the distribution of that population. So, for, like we were talking about with one bay gets silted up with a snapper and another bay stays um, uh, very light colored with a sandy bottom. If those populations are isolated from each other for a, a, or that population, well, the two populations of snapper are isolated from each other for long enough you may find that there is enough different, differentiation between those populations that they no longer breed with each other, and then you get separate species. Okay. And what, so what is a species, anyway? 
Okay, a species, let's look at this definition. It's a genetically distinct group that shares a common gene pool and is re reproductively isolated from other groups. Okay, so uh, if you think about like um, dogs, all dog species can uh, reproduce viable offspring. They can produce offspring that can produce offspring. Okay, so all dogs are considered the same species. Okay, apart from the uh, um, the mechanics of a Chihuahua and a Great Dane breeding together, um, then uh, they can produce an offspring that is um, able to reproduce itself. But um, are horses and donkeys the same species? Well, we know they're not because when they produce an offspring, which we know as a mule, then you cannot, then that mule is unable to reproduce. Okay, so those two are separate species. The horse and the donkey are separate species because they cannot, they are reproductively isolated from other, from, from each other and they cannot produce a viable offspring. Same with thing with like, uh, you can produce a, ti you can have a tiger and a um, lion mate and produce what's called a liger. And, um, I'll show you a picture of that in class, but uh, or you can go to Google Images and have a look at a liger. But there are a few, there are quite a few different uh, organisms that that can mate with each other, but don't produce um, viable offspring. Okay, and those are separate species. Okay, and one of the most amazing things that uh, Charles Darwin came up with is when he came up with this idea, and William Wallace at the same time. Um, was that if you if evolution is correct, then you can trace back uh, the you can trace back the um, ancestry along the ancestry of all organisms to a single type of organism, which would have been a very small, um, simple bacteria-like organism. Okay, so. Are and there are there's evidence for that which you can see in uh, some of the material provided and which we will be discussing in class. But evolution implies that all species have a common ancestor. Okay, and you can look at, at you can you can look at um, homologies. This is some of the evidence uh, for a common ancestor for gray apes. Okay. And essentially, we have the same skeletal structure, but with minor variations. Okay, this is Charles Darwin. He uh, wrote on the origin of species and the descent of man. And he didn't like societies, he didn't like upsetting society. And so he kept his um, material unpublished for quite a long time until this person, Alfred Russell Wallace, who came up with the idea separately, but at the same time, roughly at the same time and was wrote to Darwin, told him he was going to publish his um, his material uh, and Darwin said, okay, I better publish this quickly because otherwise I won't get credit for it. And at the time it was considered very uh, anti-religious uh, and blasphemous leading to uh, cartoons like this, okay. And um, here's another guy, important guy in, uh, in evolutionary theory, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And he had an alternative theory of evolution, which was that physical changes brought upon the parent would be passed on to the offspring. So something along the lines like if um, that evolution wasn't uh, necessarily uh, correct, but and that you could still have a biblical explanation, but that um, and that but that things did change through time, but um, it was uh, something like if you lost your arm, then your, your offspring might be born without an arm. And so what he tried to do, he was wrong, but he, at least he was thinking of, uh, of alternative explanations. And what he did was he cut off the tails of 50 generations of mice in a row, and after 50 generations, the mice were still being born with tails, which showed that um, that uh, physical changes brought upon the parent would not be passed on to the offspring. 
Okay. Now here um, you can get these links by uh, going to the Moodle page and actually um, clicking onto the uh, the PowerPoint itself. Okay, the, and uh, downloading the PowerPoint and um, going onto these, or you can just type them in. But uh, these URLs, uh, these YouTube videos are all about evolution and also some of the controversy around evolution. Okay, so that is, that covers, that's enough for this video, and uh, we'll see you in Introduction 3, Marine Invertebrate Life Histories.